Thanks very much, James. Now that we have had a good comprehensive description of what goes under the name of Modi's foreign policy, I think we should move towards our next objective, which is to evaluate the doctrine mesh of this ensemble of ideas. I am a bit of a stickler for conceptual clarity, because if you have fuzzy concepts, you can be proved neither right nor wrong. In fact, I would argue you don't know what you're talking about. So, we have to have clear criteria of what is a doctrine and the panel has already given us plenty to chew on. For example, is it distinctive? Is it cohesive? Is it purposive? Has it got enough power to draw a kind of Lakshman Rekha kind of boundary to say, this is where we stand, otherwise we can, don't touch us without our permission. If we don't have that, I will not know if it's merely a um, Panchashila of our times, that it's uh, merely war play. There is a throwaway sentence in this book which says, the time has now come to move over from being merely a balancing power to a leading power, from being dominated to dominant, without being domineered. These are for me as a student of foreign policy, new ideas. The surgical strike, we have seen that in Professor Rajamon's recent publication with ISAS, is a distinctive message that this is where we stand. Now, these are things that you have to claim back and brand as the Modi doctrine. If not, we would remain where we were, in a very dangerous, ambiguous war play, which was I think for me as a student of foreign policy, some of the downside of the imperial regime's foreign policy, big signals, or no signals at all. With that, I will open the general discussion by my disagreeing with your opening statement, Vijayji. Uh, you are not the old one out in a think tank where you are here because you are a thinking person. Unthinking persons stay out. So everyone is a thinker, everyone is welcome to join in. What I will try to do is to um, build questions together, like I'll take three questions at a time. I've already invited a colleague, uh, what is, uh, a Mr. Chandu Bedi, to take notes because we'll be publishing some of the findings of this uh, workshop because this being Singapore, we believe in turning tax dollars into policy analysis, it will be published. So please remember, your thinking actually goes towards the contribution uh, to the ISA's thinking, which will uh, find a published form. So with this, I open the general discussion. I'll now take questions. Please raise your hands or catch my eye. Uh, okay. I will recognize first Dr. Uh, Prasindar, and then I'll recognize my colleague, Mr. Surya. Um, thank you, Mitra. Uh, I won't talk about the Modi doctrine explicitly, but when I mean, come up with the questions. This first question is maybe to Raja, actually, is one question. Raja, if so much has changed, a lot of things haven't changed as well. I especially think about the conflict in Syria. Once again, we see no clear idea about what kind of role India wants to play. I wonder whether you, I might be wrong. What you think. And Afghanistan again. This is not something that's really like India has done. Things have changed because Pakistan hasn't done things very well. So, is there another opportunity in Afghanistan? Can the Modi government do something in Afghanistan? This is just a one question. The second question is actually to, to Raja and actually uh, James as well. Is one major part of China's engagement with economic globalization is its uh, success in building connectivity. I mean, we know about the Ganga trade, the Greater Mekong sub-region, etc., etc. And one major part about how China has managed to engage with economic globalization is how the state in China has been transformed. Right? The deep provinces taking Yunnan province, Guangxi, Tonglos province taking a lead role, different parts. And now people say Chinese foreign policy is no longer some big grand design. It's actually different agencies struggling with each other and something comes out and we all on the outside think oh this is something that we think about. Is India undergoing a similar
similar kind of state transformation. I mean, the models are obviously different. China's got provinces, India's got federal units. But the periphery is something happening. I'm just wondering. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sonia? crossing the, overcoming rather the strategic restraint of the previous regimes. And uh, you mentioned Balochistan in particular and also crossing the LOC or the surgical strike in terms of Pakistan. Now with reference to China, do you think, uh, this is also addressed to Professor Raja Mohan at the same time, do you think uh, there is a possibility of India redefining its policy on Tibet with reference to China? Then the question to Mr. James Crabtree. Uh, do you think there is a possibility of uh, redefining India's relationship with the U.S. after the next president comes to the White House? Thank you. Okay, since there is no third question going up at the moment, I would uh, ask uh, Mr. Raja Mohan to answer. I think uh, I just wanted to start by addressing the question I think uh, Professor Mitra has raised a couple of times. I think there is a problem of, as academics, we trying to make sense of the real world. And the real world doing its own thing. So I think, well, in the, when you convert or to aggregate, to theorize on real world developments, we use different uh, methodologies, different tools, different uh, ideas. But I think in the end, when you're dealing with a dynamic system, uh, I don't think you should, this is not physics in the end. It's still, you know, it is, there is a, 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 a level of, uh, shall we say, fluidity to how we deal with the world. And I think, so, so therefore, I think when you say doctrine, I, mean, I think uh, even in the religious, where doctrine actually starts from, I think it is in the religious context of doctrine, doctrinaire and all that stuff came out. There, I mean, you could decree the, the, the high priest could declare it decree something, even then for a period of time, how we interpret it, all that changes. And in the case of uh, foreign policy doctrines, it's really an American point edge. Like if the president is supposed to have his own doctrine, uh, but then, you know, it, it becomes we all can take it from there. Not as a definitive final state, but as a way of seeing the departures from the past, as a way of capturing some main things. So it is not going to be a single comprehensive concept that's going to explain everything, both past and future, of the particular government. I mean, take the Bush doctrine. Uh, if you say 2005, if you heard his speech, promotion of democracy. I mean, roaring, fantastic, the rhetoric of speech. I mean, there, at the end of it, there's nothing. I mean, he, he couldn't get the, you know, you say, look, we want to promote democracy in Burma, which is a weak country. But China, we're not going to be interested in democracy, because China is a rich country. So that kind of ambivalence in terms of how big ideas relate to the real world will always be. So I, I don't think, in that sense, I think the test to put to Modi doctrine would be an unfair one and, and not yield significant results. And I think once you see the messiness of foreign policy, because the assumption is, look, I got a doctrine, I'm entering the world, therefore I'm going to deal with it. The world is an answer. The world is a dynamic. Who would have expected the Afghan situation would change so dramatically? So you can have any doctrine, but you dealing with as prime ministers, don't go back and look at the doctrine. He says, look, right now I have a new situation. How do I deal? Therefore, what you can capture with this is some sense of a broader shift in ideas. And I think to that extent, it's, it's, it's useful. And that brings me to the question that Sinder asked. Look, I think what has changed in the Middle East is not, look, see, I don't know if anybody knows what to do, <laughs> except Mr. Putin. The Americans are struggling to, they want to fight DISIS and, you know, and uh, uh, our dear friend Assad at the same time. So, I don't think, the Middle East had clarity. Bush came in with a great clarity, right? I mean, 9-11, I mean, you saw what happened. Uh, Obama came and said a great speech in Turkey, you know, the 2009 and said Islamic world, I'm going to deal with it. Nothing has come out. So, so, I think this idea that, look, you can have a different, what has changed in the Middle East is this, I think what uh, Vijay pointed out, must be a pragmatism. Started out more open, Israel, his relationship is not in secret, it's in public domain. But at the same time, today you are in a position to step up your engagement with the Saudis and the Iranians and the Turks and whoever it is who is willing to do it. It is that change, I think, is more consequential. 
Because what was changed in the before in 91 under Prasama Rao, Congress pulled back in the new Pega. So this guy is saying, look, we're not apologetic about engaging Israel. Well. That doesn't mean I'll ignore the 300 million Arabs. There's business to be done on all sides, and I think that is the shift that much is important. Second, on Afghanistan, which uh, even uh, Surya raised, look, I think 2011 under Congress government, one month ago, we signed this strategic partnership, which had an explicit paragraph on military assistance. But the UPA government was hesitant because it didn't want to upset the Pakistanis. I don't think this government is concerned about upsetting the Pakistanis. <laughs> so they say, okay, uh, that doesn't mean you go crazy, I mean, because there are geographic limitations. But the fact is that today, this government handed over the helicopters, it's willing to do more things. And I think that's the new thing. So there is some change in Afghanistan within your means. Today, why are the Americans coming to India and saying, let's work together on Afghanistan? A fact that didn't exist before. In fact, Americans were telling us 10 years ago, lay off. To one of saying, actually, come in because we can't deal with the Pakistanis anymore, maybe we can work together. Similarly, Iran, India, Iran, and Afghanistan are working together. So I think there is a shift, uh, and I think it's an important one that brings us to the connectivity issue as well. I think there's a big problem for India on the connectivity. So we talked the talk, but we couldn't deliver. I think this Prime Minister has tried to put in more energy, is having more reviews of actual project implementation. Uh, we'll see the results in the next two years. That is putting more pressure on the system to deliver on project implementation. If you can do the Chabahar project, and if you do the, the Kaladan River project in the east, you would have said, look, here is a transformation you can implement. And if in Sri Lanka, you can say, look, we can implement a big project. So I think the test is still out, the jury is still out there, but the talk is different, and the, there is, seems to be more purpose, but the dimensions. On the role of states, I don't want to advertise my institute here, but, uh, uh, which is, we just done a paper on the role of the states in foreign policy. This government has talked about cooperative federalism, role for states and foreign policy. Some things have happened, both in terms of attracting foreign capital and the most important. But on the actually drawing them in, in on the security issues, is still some distance away, but at least it's, it's a different idea. <coughs> but in terms of the other issues that you raised about uh, Tibet, which is Surya raised, I mean, look, I think it's a, it's a hard one. And unless you're forced into that, I would say at this point, uh, maybe you can answer the question, right? <laughs> you take the challenge. Yeah. Well, in a short, the answer is no. <laughs> it won't be another position. At least, in the, I don't see it that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's sort of strengthened on the issue of the, the Indian states and whether it's the same as China. Um, it almost seems as if the Indian situation is the opposite, where particularly within the region, if you look at the influence that Tamil Nadu has on Sri Lankan politics, or Bengal with um, Bangladesh, um, th th there is a long-standing role of state policy interfering in foreign policy, and almost you want to sort of move away from that if the argument is that the Chinese are sort of moving towards it. I think that's been there in India for quite a long time, although not quite in the way that you are suggesting, of sort of state-run Chinese companies bidding for contracts and then sort of foreign policy following along. Um, I mean, my sense is, this may be slightly crude, but my sense is that India should learn um, from the Chinese model, which has been pretty effective, which is that you, know, you develop institutions of your own, or if you can, then you try and shape those, for instance, like the BRICS Bank, ones which you do have some influence over, um, and you use the fact that you're a bigger and richer country than your neighbors to give them what they need, and India has a mixed record at best in terms of delivering the type of connectivity projects that you're talking about, as well as providing uh, development finance with Mr. Jayashankar at the Indian Ocean Summit, which the uh, which was held here in Singapore a month, two months ago. In his speech, gave a kind of rundown of some of the, the, the development assistance that India was giving around the region. But the you know the amounts of money involved are you know not nothing. But uh, if you compare them, they're not remotely in the lead of what. Um, China just did in Bangladesh, uh, or you know the way in which China is instantly reshaping its relationship with the Philippines at the moment. You, know, you can see uh, the value of these types of economic relationships. Um, I mean, as for what's going to happen under Touchwood, President Clinton, 
Uh, I mean, I think in a sense it's all good for India. I mean, my, my sense is that the, if you read uh, Kurt Campbell's book, The Pivot to Asia, you know, the, the sensible part of the American diplomatic community see this as a half-done program, that you know, there's a lot of pivoting left to be done. And my reading would be that under President Clinton, they're going to continue with this process of attempting to strengthen alliances around the region. And that just will make the, in a sense, the good and the bad that I mentioned the start of my remarks more pronounced, which is the, the value of India as a strategic counterweight to China, not just in America, but amongst almost everybody else is going to continue rising, but that simply makes it more delicate for India to, to sort of manage these relationships while not frowning off the Chinese, who more than anyone else have the ability to kind of make trouble if they, if they want to. So, you know, it's a kind of curse and a blessing, this, I think, but I, I can see, you know, there's many dimensions in which the uh, U.S. India relationship could continue continue to strengthen, and I think it becomes a kind of strategic choice for India how far down that road it is going to want to go, how, how far it thinks it can take this on. I mean, I think it's, the door is clearly open. So. Thanks very much. Our panelists have been remarkably concise, which is why we have enough time to go into at least two more rounds. At the moment, I have three names on my list. I'll call them in that order, Atulji, colleague over there, and Dr. Jivanta Shetty. Hi, uh, my name is Atul, the moniker from Global Schools. Uh, you know, much of what we see in the engagement and relations alliances, etc., that uh, Mr. Modi has established, quite a lot of it existed in his approach in Gujarat. Uh, I happened to speak to somebody who worked with him before even he became a chief minister, and he shared something very interesting that you know, he used to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, travel to villages in a doubt or a jeep, and basically go to find out what are the issues affecting the villages and in the remote areas. Um, I think he, he has an approach of uh, very sharp research. Uh, much of it, he does it personally at times. And what you see him doing on a world stage is exactly what he did as a statesman uh, in a, in a, at a state level. Um, be the relations that now he's establishing with the other countries as well. So my questions are uh, very specific. One is on uh, to Mr. Raja. This morning I watched uh, Mr. Trump and uh, you know the discussion debate, presidential debate, uh, while coming to Singapore, and uh, I realized that at, at core is basically uh, jobs and terrorism, the core two central issues. Uh, India has the two issues as well. India is doing its own approach through various programs and counter-terrorism. Uh, the question to Mr. Raja is, if Mr. Trump or whoever gets engaged in the US presidential side, do, the, do, you, do you see India playing a role in counter-terrorism measures uh, in alliance with the US? And question to Mr. Vijay is that, is there, is, is there so much of engagement that you see happening with various countries, and you said 192 countries, is it going to bear any significant, if you can name two or three major uh, Initiatives that will you know, help India in its world affairs. Thank you. Thank you. I am Adrian Villanova. I'm a business consultant and a friend of India. Also, my eldest son has uh, successfully negotiated for some projects in India. I'm glad. Now, the thing is this, uh, I've taken some note, and I must uh, say that we are all very interested in uh, deliveries, but uh, I'd like to find out whether there are priorities in this doctrine. In the sense that, I mean, uh, it's not an easy country, it's not an easy decision, okay? But uh, I think, uh, basically, economic is the most important thing, besides, of course, security and investments. So I hope that, uh, what do you call it, along these lines, you have the expertise and you have the experts to deal with this situation. And I hope it's not like China, whereby one person deals with everything and everybody follows. I think, uh, hopefully, in India it will be different. There will be some specialists who will advise the Prime Minister Modi. Now, the other question I would like to direct to is, uh, Mr. Kratri, you were saying about India and China. We have not mentioned anything about Russia because if you read the papers, there is this close relationship or becoming close relationship with Russia because Russia has always been uh, the armed supplier to India. Uh, how does this situation put uh, 
whole of security uh, within the Indian Ocean, especially with the dealing with the Americans. Okay? In the sense that the Americans are, are hoping that India will be on their side, but the Russians are also hoping Putin is going to Syria. Maybe the China is interested in stream of course. So how does this tie up where Russia is concerned? Thank you. China on how to put the principle of power above the presumed power of principle. That's a very interesting um, line. So how, how should the two actually um, be calculated? On the terror, counter-terror coalition, it's not that you know, the coming of the next president is going to make all the difference. I think for the Americans, Terrorism, counter-terrorism, and international cooperation around it is quite this kind of And I think our cooperation with them has also significantly increased in the last few years since 2011. But I think there was a problem partly because of Pakistan. They were limiting what they could do with us. But in 2011, when the attacks of Mumbai, in fact, the maximum help we got was from the Americans. And I think that was very helpful in many ways. But there's still the question of how does the role of Pakistan fit into this? How far can we go? I think I think we're beginning to overcome that under this government a lot more. And my sense is that will continue. But it's not going to be that India is just going to be one part of some grand American. There's no grand design. President if Obama, if Bush talked about what, the Great War on Terror, Obama administration would even want to use the word. That's what Dr. It says violent extremes, struggle against violent extremes. That was Obama's plan. But I think what we've seen happen under this government is really the expansion of counter-terror cooperation with a large number of other countries. Saudi Arabia today is a very important partner for India on counter-terror. UAE has become a very important partner for India. Because I think because the way the Middle Eastern countries have been affected by this, today they're willing to overcome their traditional friendship with the Pakistanis to say, look, helping India also helps us. In Bangladesh, for example, under, under Hasina in the last five years, there's been a significant expansion of counter-terror cooperation. So I would say it is not just for the US that India needs to do a lot more as one of the major victims of terrorism. It has a lot to learn from others. It's got a lot to share with others. So I would see that expanding irrespective of who becomes the, uh, the US president. Uh, the question on Russia, Russia is like, you know, uh, I don't want to get here, but, then, but let me say this. Look, I think we don't want to let go of the Russian relationship. That's what the message from Britain the Russians are also concerned about India getting too close to the Americans. Uh, are they losing the market dominance in India? So every two years we buy a big, we do a big deal with the Russians to keep them happy. So I think both sides understand that. I mean that the Russians will be there, but they're not going to be the only ones in the defense game. And we have the Americans today probably, perhaps because the Russians, Israelis are a big player, French are gaining ground. So I would say, look, I think as long as there is a great power dynamic, I don't think India would want to dump the Russians. So we would look for, I think, whoever the new president is, if there is a US Russian rapprochement or a reset, that will improve the space for it. Because what we tell the American friends is look, by isolating Russia, you actually help the Chinese. That if you want a long term balance, Russia will have a role. And I think there, my sense is uh, if Trump talks about being nice to Russia, even today, you'll see that those of you follow the debate. But we don't know where the American debate is going. But the fact is, look, we want to abandon Russia for the sake of others. I think what a Prime Minister said, uh, that Putin standing next to him, one old friend is better than two good friends. That was a message to Indians as well as to the Russians, saying, look, you think Pakistan can be a great friend, think twice. So I think it, it's a dynamic relationship <coughs> for today. The problem is not on the defense side, the problem is on the economic side. The trade on the non-defense, non-oil side is not growing. And that's where the challenge is, how do you build a normal economic relationship with Russia? There, there are severe problems, and I think how we go over. One power and principle, 
I would say, look, I think most countries tend to talk about principle but actually go by power. Except in a brief revolutionary phase where the Bolshevik revolution, the Chinese revolution, the Iranian revolution, where you presume there is a doctrine that overwhelms national interest. But slowly they all come down to doing national interest. But in the Indian case, I think the problem has been the public discourse has pretended as if the principle is higher than power. About non alignment, about we are goody goody, we are like sliced bread, we are moral politics. This is a self deception. Yeah. But if you see Nehru, the same Nehru who was talking about high moral ground, was also the one who signed the treaties with Nepal and Bhutan, which are hegemonic treaties, I mean, because the small countries were asking for India's protection. But I think the problem is not with state policy as much as the way those of us who study foreign policy have constructed the discourse, which is fundamentally a historic, not based on empirics, but merely saying, oh, India is great, non aligned, therefore India is idealist, and therefore it is not power. But what, that, what has happened under Modi is this. I think he's removed the last shreds of that veil, which began to go from 1991. Essentially, he doesn't use the word non aligned. He doesn't talk about, you know, India playing a moral role. He says, look, India's interests, India is going to pursue them without being inhibited, unabashed. Therefore, the catch up is really with us, with those of us who study foreign policy, who continue to frame as if the problem is of departure from some kind of a golden standard out there, which is moral politics. But as India becomes strong, as James was saying earlier, that it is the third largest economy, BPP terms of day, in real terms of the coming down the road. It will have to take measures that are in self interest. I think it is a change where, or partly I think is a challenge for those of us who do research on foreign policy, India's international relations, to deconstruct some of the earlier myths and to put it in a more empirical perspective. But in an empirical story too, what we've seen in the last few years is that it's a decisive break from a number of propositions like vis a vis the Chinese, vis a vis the Americans, where actually even when you have interests, you don't seem to follow through them, we begin to change. So I would say, I think they will be like any other great power. As a large power, as a democratic power, you can't say you don't have any principles. You can't say it's all national interest. Even the Chinese have to justify it in terms of ideology. So you'll always need a wrapping to present your interests. But you should be clear to yourself that what you're doing is about pursuit of interest, but you need to explain it to your own people, to the world, and that requires a, a, a relationship to a, a, a set of principles. So I think the, the clarity in terms of how we see this too, and the relationship between the two, I think is changing under the present balance. Thanks very much. Thank you. To answer a full uh, one or two or three priority areas, uh, I would definitely say that uh, business and investment in India is one of the top priority, which should be linked to the job creation, because that is something which India is facing, and therefore uh, foreign investment both to make in India as well as in India is uh, a priority. In the same context, uh, more and more jobs were globally are being created by a small and medium sized micro industry, and therefore uh, Prime Minister Modi. Campaign of Startup India uh, and it's linking with the changing in several bottlenecks uh, and ease of doing business. So, as to attract foreign investment, it is a an important thing. Second, definitely a uh, security dimension is there and the whole range of agreements uh, to buy different supplies and new technology with various countries, including Israel, Russia, US, France and also connected to it in the energy sector, the nuclear fuel for our reactors, in signing deals with Russia and France, and nuclear for uranium supplies from countries like Canada, Australia. This is second uh, important one. And third, which is again going by the India's important for softball, is all these initiatives on yoga, and uh, Modi has missed a lot on uh, revitalizing or uh, the connections 
with Buddhist countries and that is something not well documented so far but that is one should understand and he has given several speeches and talks on this. So in those lines, on the civilizational lines, also one of the priorities. Thank you. Um, I mean, the issue of Russia, which you asked me about, I, I, it's not something I know a vast amount about. I would almost defer to Roger because he wrote his splendid piece about um, the sort of pre BRICS relationship with Russia and the Indian Express. I mean, I suppose all I'd say is that the relationship that India has with Russia is, if not unidimensional, but it doesn't have as many dimensions to it as it used to have. It's heavily dominated, as you said, by arms, as Roger said, by energy, um, so you have Korean GC investing in Russian gas fields, and you have a Russian bank rescuing a delinquent Indian conglomerate you know, with some sort of full of debt. But the, the commercial relationships between the two countries have not been terribly happy I mean, from the system. I am TS, a mobile company, we've got into all sorts of trouble in India. There haven't been any huge um, Indian success stories in Russia outside of the energy sector that I can immediately bring to mind. Um, so I think compared to some of these other relationships, it will remain important, but, uh, but limited in its dimensions. And I suppose as a, uh, I just sort of echo actually what um, PJ said at a separate point, it's always occurred to me that the, in a sense that soft power, whether that's media, communications, the diaspora, um, uh, the power of example of India's democracy, uh, Sort of the Indian system, what Larry Summers in 2010 called, um, sort of tried to christen a Mumbai consensus, the notion that India could become a, a democratic developmental state that was a model for other emerging markets, that this is something that has always been sort of rather underplayed in Indian foreign policy, and that part of the power of American leadership came from, you know, whether it is now seen to be declining or at what speed it seemed to be declining, a large portion of its power came from you know, the, sort of, uh, the fact that people um, as, uh, agreed with its ideals and uh, aspired to have elements of the same kind of system and, and the extent to which Mr. Modi is making a deliberate effort to push that seems to be very sensible uh, because uh, you know, in the end what I was arguing which is that India needs to take a leaf out of the Chinese book and um, open its pocket but in the end you, you know, a wiser strategy to balance that with other elements of softer power that you know, other, other countries and peoples aspire to have and I think India has latent strengths that potentially far exceed those that China has, and so the extent to which the country can make more of that, I think that would be very sensible. Thank you very much. I'm going to close the Q&A with uh, a second round, for which there are two questions. I'll recognize Ambassador Ithika Chaudhary and then a Prodologer Sen. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to all the panelists for excellent presentations, I think, each one of you. Uh, Chairman, um, you, uh, at the outset, you mentioned uh, responsibility to protect, but uh, uh, no, no, uh, no speaker spoke to this uh, idea or uh, concept. Uh, it is actually a concept, it's not so much, it's not a doctrine at all, nor is this a principle, Professor uh, Rajamohan, this, uh, this idea of principle is, it's not even a principle, it's simply a concept. Uh, just to, uh, for the understanding of the audience, uh, the, the, the essence of the principle is that it is the responsibility of every government to protect its population. If any government is unable to or unwilling to protect any segment of its population, that this responsibility would devolve on the international community, which operating through the United Nations will exercise this responsibility. Uh, it's not an easy concept, it's, it's, it is fraught with uh, lots of risks, as you have hinted yourself. Uh, uh, the West was supposed to have used it in Libya and all that uh, to, to justify its actions, which has been used in the Middle East. India initially was, of course, opposed to it. Uh, but eventually, the Indian opposition softened. Uh, not because India wants to, uh, 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 to take advantage of this to 
uh, to resort to it in, 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 in its, within its area of competence or neighborhood or whatever with regard to Tamils in Sri Lanka, for instance, or Balochis, as we, we have heard in Pakistan. Uh, here it, it, it is fraught with some risks, so uh, I think India would do well to steer, to, to uh, continue to steer clear of this concept. I have a question though. The question is with the United Nations, which is really related. One of the thrusts of the previous Congress government was a permanent membership of the Security Council. What has happened to it under the BJP? Is this still a goal? And if so, to what extent it, 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 uh, is India working towards it or is the government working towards it? I have uh, two very deep questions, one for Raja and one for Raja. But, uh, but for Raja, no, one of the uh, elements of India's response to you know, what happened in, in, in Kashmir, uh, in Pakistan, was of course the you know, so surgical strikes. But on the issue of uh, the international isolation of Kashmir, of, of Pakistan, would you say that India has been relatively less successful, especially when you look at the you know, statements coming out from China and even Russia in the big sum? And this uh, question for uh, Dr. Chatwal is, uh, you know, when you were mentioning uh, the earlier government's understanding of the diaspora and the NRIs as ATM machines, I assume you were, uh, you were referring to remittances and investment, would you say that the uh, current government has been far more smarter in creating a political constituency amongst the NRIs for the BJP as well as for, for raising funds for further actions? Thanks very much. I'll now invite the panel to take a minute or two each. I think uh, on the R2P, I think it's one of those post 89 delusions. The idea that the international system can transcend national sovereignty, or that the great powers acting through the UN have the resources, power, and the will to re engineer our system. That is not Libya is the last to nail that and that shown quite clearly. There's no stomach today in the West for those kind of interventions. What we learned from Trump, what we're learning from Brexit. That period when the West is going to take on everybody's uh, fix everybody's house, we're beyond that thing. So so I think this whatever the framing in the UN was eventually in two thousand five, look, there is no stomach to do the kind of things that Bush did in Libya. Sorry, in Libya, not Bush, I mean because of the Obama but before that in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think there is an exhaustion with the interventions. I would say that would come down. But interventions of a different kind of happening in the Middle East. Saudis are intervening wherever they can. The Iranians do the interventions. Uh, Chinese, now, a lot of us used to criticize the Chinese and Indians. You guys don't intervene enough. You're too much sovereignty oriented. Chinese do a lot more intervention these days. And people don't like it because uh, they push their way in. They say, look, the Thailand must deliver the five guys who killed my guys on the Mekong. So you see an assertion. So I think it is about power finally again. It's not about the construction of a set of illusions between 89 to 2000, more recently, that somehow the international system, collective security, multilateral institutions will transcend human problems. I think that, uh, I think we've been inoculated against it at least for a while. On the permanent seat, I mean, I would say the same thing. I think uh, I don't see it's going to happen anytime soon. But unfortunately, the present government uh, seems to have adopted that as a goal, just as the previous government. Uh, but I don't see that happening in any uh, any significant way. So therefore, I would say we should forget about it. But again, coming back to the question, if you have power, that will get reflected in the equations. And not go for the reflections of power, which is even to get the Chinese No, no, they, they continue to push because, you know, your, your colleagues in our foreign office, they love this stuff. So they all, all foreign offices do the same thing. So they love this more and more of the same thing. But, but I think uh, as a realist, I would say Modi has seen, I think after his two visits to the UN, there's not much uh, in this business. But on uh, international isolation, I have a view that, look, whatever the government might say for the public, domestic, I don't see you can isolate any country. That North Korea can't be isolated from China, can it be isolated? Pakistan is not going to be isolated from the Chinese. But we've seen actually what this government's credit, it has got the Saudis to support us. So the UAE got a large number of countries to be support us. We got all the SARC members to boycott the meeting in, in Pakistan. So these are some of the gains. But that doesn't mean, look, take it literally, 
that you can actually, everybody in the world is going to say exactly what we are saying on Pakistan and terrorism. That's not going to happen. That's not the real world. But I think it's, it's an overstated goal and I would say uh, in terms of the actual practice, I think it is quite moderate. On diaspora, I would say, look, the last 40 years, ever since more Indians went abroad, I know, for example, Harkishan Singh Soji of CPM. He used to go to Vancouver regularly to raise money. He used to go to the West Coast of the US to raise money. So I would say across the board, all like just as the Bombay film industry today releases films on the same day in, in the US as in Bombay and in London. And I think there is a constituency with money. The question of all political parties are tapping into it. And BJP is doing it a lot more vigorously, I would say, uh, than, the, than the previous ones. Well, uh, the diaspora outreach of BJP uh, and Prime Minister Modi, definitely the primary aim is not fund collection. Uh, to give you one example, we conduct all these di big diaspora events with uh, big budget. And uh, generally I go there several weeks or months in advance to talk to the community. And first thing I tell them is that this is going to be your program, managed by you, coordinated by you, and funded by you. And I also say that I don't need a penny out of it. I don't need even to you cover my own expenses. And that is the very consistent message which we give. What I, but therefore funding is not the primary objective here. What is happening is a big transformation. If you see. The diaspora is extremely fragmented in most of them. Again, to give an example, and I can talk about it for hours together. In Bay Area, in Silicon Valley alone, there are 450 Indian community organizations. In London City alone, there are 650 community organizations. Not in England, forget about the entire UK. So, this is so much fragmented. And it's a very rare opportunity for us that they are all coming together. And that is, I would say, is the biggest success of past problems and practice. And there are several other collateral benefits that I would say for some, at least temporarily. Uh, Modi has become the unifying force for the diaspora. Thank you very much. Um, I'm quite happy to pass up. I know those questions are direct to me, so I'm, uh, I, I'll. Uh, I'll for my, uh, my final remarks. <laughs> okay, um, I'll now take a few minutes to uh, share some of my own opinions and then some of the conversations. Um, whether you like it or not, concepts have a life of their own. If you say state, you don't mean a political party. If you say paradigm or doctrine, you indicate a bunch of ideas and whether you want it or not, what you put under the label of paradigms or doctrines will be measured by those. I mean, sitting next to me is a microbiologist who would agree that that's how systematic conversations take place. So if you put the word doctrine on the cover, the book will be judged in terms of the doctrine of the ideas that go in. Second point, thinkers and actors. There's a very famous line from Milton Friedman who says, the expert billiard player does not need to know trigonometry. But if you know trigonometry, you will understand what makes him an expert billiard player. It's not the job of the actor to do our job. Our job is to find those clues which connect thought to action, which is the whole idea behind doctrines. It's a device by which you send signals. If you have a doctrine called the Brezhnev Doctrine, the United States will know where not to send the CIA folks or face a retribution. So action, reaction, connectivity is what doctrines are about. Today, the world, at least the relevant world knows, 
that if you hit India at Pathan Kota it will be hit at destinations which are known to you and to us, not to the whole world. Plus, like Prime Minister Bajpai said, after the six nuclear tests, five nuclear tests, that today we have the bomb. And it is there not to have a picnic, but for purposes of defense and if necessary offense. He was saying clearly what India did not say clearly in 1974. I was, I was a student then in the United States and Walter Conkite went to Delhi, set up a studio to interview Indira Gandhi. So, Madam Prime Minister, why did you explode the bomb? She said, no, no, it's not a bomb. What is it? It's a peaceful nuclear explosion. So, what is the peaceful purpose it is meant for? It was a one-to-one -one live interview and there were no advisors and when they got nervous, she would take days of her study and start doing it. So she said, well, you see, it's meant to move Earth. And how to move Earth? Well, you dig canals. And what a contact, I think she stopped the interview at that point. Now, this is what happens when you don't have a clear idea as to why you are doing what you are doing. So our job is to connect what is happening out there to what is happening in the area of conceptual innovation. So I would need to know what is distinctive, what is cohesive, what is purposive, and what is powerful about the policies of Prime Minister Modi. So when I see from one of the three editors of this book, statements like Panchamrita has clearly emerged as the new supporting pillars of India's foreign policy under Prime Minister Modi. I ask myself, are we talking about a haval or are we talking about a foreign policy? Those who don't know what is Amrit is it's a sacred substance for Hinduism, like common. So what are these five sacred um, substances? Samma, dignity and honor. Samba, greater engagement and dialogue. Samriti, shared prosperity, Suraksha, regional and global security, and Sanskriti evam Sabhata, cultural and civilizational linkage. Well, I think you have said it all, and you have said nothing, because if something is everything, then it is nothing. How does this differ from Pantashila? Or is Narendra Modi a Jawaharlal Nehru of our time? Of course he's not. So it's our job in a think tank and as analyst to deconstruct and show what is new and how is it different from the fudge that used to go under the name of foreign policy of the previous regime. I think our work is not done yet. With this uh, Conclusive, inconclusive, conclusive note. I'd like to invite you all, invite Jordan to come forward with some tips for our speakers. And while I'm giving those gifts, please uh, make up your minds if you're going to join me in an applause. To not yet, not yet, not yet. You, have to, you have to make up your mind, but first let me give those gifts. The gifts I have are a gift of our think tank. It's called Smart Diplomacy, written by one of my smart colleagues, because that's what we need to make sense out of uh, Narendra Modi's foreign policy and to see the distinctiveness of it. <laughs> well, the I'll hand it over to him. And ladies and gentlemen, a think tank's a think tank's work is never done. Uh, if it were, we'd be out of a business. So as you can see, we have generated today some very, very powerful, probably very interesting questions that should go into policy analysis, interpretation of what is happening out there, and conceptual analysis because that's the only way we, the think tank, can hold our heads high 
and say to any West that you are a highly ranked university and we are a highly ranked think tank. Because some of these ideas should go into publications where we would ask ourselves, is there a new conceptual innovation? Is Panchamrita not the same as Panchashila, but something new? What that is, I still don't know. So, if you have made up your mind that we have made some progress today, please join me to thank our speakers. Okay, I invite you all now for a couple of minutes of time.